Hi, welcome to Visual Studio Toolbox. I'm your host, Robert Green, coming to you from the studio here on the Microsoft campus. And no, this is not the new uh, design scheme in my home. We're actually on campus. Uh, we're here for the VS Live Developer Conference, and my guest is one of the speakers from that show, Jim Woolley. Hi, Jim. Good to see you again. Good to see you, too. Yeah. yeah, especially in person. Yes. <laughs> awesome. Always good to be back in person at events like this. Yeah. We're going to talk a little bit today about code analyzers. Mm -hmm. And what are they? Why should we be using them? And why should we be making it more a part of our developer process? Yeah. Uh, my name is Jim Woolley. I am a senior delivery principal at Slalom, which is a consulting firm. Uh, if you don't know that title, it means we, I go out and help customers build products and lead teams and trying to solution um, products for those particular companies. Okay. And uh, I've been doing uh, software now for over 25 years. I've been a Microsoft MVP for 18 years. Mm -hmm. I started out in Visual Basic, which I know that you uh, <laughs> love from the old, good old That's days. Right. The old um, days. Yeah, and I still focus on uh, language features, and that's one of the reasons why I sort of got involved with Roslyn, which mm -hmm. is the revised version of the compiler that uh, the that teams came out with uh, back in, you know, it's yeah, over two, 10 years ago at yeah. this point so when Roslyn first came out, and they rewrote the compilers and allowed for other capabilities, and one of those is what we're going to be talking about here okay, today. Okay, cool. All so. right, so what are we talking about? Yeah, uh, so I just tried to say uh, we have... Uh, Analyzers or linters are the are tools that are able to look at your code and find issues or things about the code. Okay. Uh, sometimes it may be finding uh, security vulnerabilities, which is a, a key, key reason why people do this. Might be finding typical performance issues. Maybe just finding common code smells. Mm, okay. Maybe finding if your code doesn't agree with your coding standards. Uh, or a language coding standard. So, for example, we know that in C Sharp, uh, we put the curly open curlies in a different place than JavaScript does. Right. And so, for example, if we uh, showed our code to somebody and weren't using the idiomatic w ways of doing those kinds of things, then somebody else looking at our code may say, ooh, you, you put that curly in the wrong place, which means that you don't know how to code whatsoever. And that may not be the case at all, but just because you're not using the standards of what that particular paradigm is doing, okay. uh, then it uh, you know, sort of leads question over what your code is. Okay. Also, you want to have that standards so that you can have a repeatable process and uh, making sure that you can maintain your own code or other people in the team can maintain the code. Because you don't want everybody creating their own code. It's sort of like a wrestling rumble where sure. everybody's trying to throw everybody out the ring as compared right. to we want to work together as a team okay. and, and build these things together and make, make them all cohesive. Um, there's also benefits of being able to find maybe newer ways of doing things. So it's really hard over time to uh, make sure that you're always using the latest version of right. a language feature or even knowing that a language feature exists that yep. would make your life simpler. And so being able to do these kinds of things will be able to simplify that as well. Or so I guess lots even of good advantages if you've there. been working on a project over time, you come back to it a year later and start coding in a slightly different way because maybe you've now learned a new feature or a new style. I guess you could use this to enforce consistency across a single code base that you're mm -hmm. working on over time, right? Yeah. All and right. so that way, you know, if you put it away for six months and you come back to it, you don't have to rethink in your mind exactly how is this supposed to you know, work and what, right. was, what was I doing before. You're using those standards and, and having those standards enforced. Okay. And so that way the tools can then do that enforcement, and you can then let the people focus on the real important stuff, which is adding business value, right. and enforcing the business logic rather than just syntactical kinds okay. of things. Well, that sounds cases. cool. How do I make that happen? Yeah. Uh, well, well, first of all, just use Visual Studio. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Visual Studio Toolkit here. Um, and, um, or you know, other tools allow for use of these Roslyn and analyzers as well. Analyzers, there are all sorts of different analyzers for different languages. We're going to focus mm -hmm. here for the C-sharp version, okay. right? Um, and so I have a, a little sample code here, uh, which the, camp, the code, as you see here, has zero errors, which means we're, we're good to go. We're yep. going to go ahead and ship, ship it, right? It. 
Uh, no problems whatsoever that right. happen, right? Um, there are some warnings in the code, and maybe we might want to take, pay attention to those warnings. Okay. And uh, uh, there are some messages as well, some informational types of things. All of these are actually powered by Roslyn under the covers. Right. So with Roslyn, they rewrote the, rewrote the compiler, and not only did they rewrite the compiler, they also made it extensible so that Visual Studio could hook into that and find additional things. But also, other people can then add their own capabilities, and maybe there's domain-specific things. Mm -hmm. So for example, example, uh, maybe there, if you're pulling in Azure dependencies, maybe Azure may have, and here are analyzers for the oh, best ways of doing cool. Azure types okay. of things. Or in individual domains, they may have things that can then check your code to, in, to enforce things that the compiler says, well, I take a string here, so a string's a string, it's going to be good. Mm -hmm. Well, if we're making a URI and that string's not a URI, then the compiler will say, it's great. But then when you get it to runtime, you're going to have a failure on that one. Because in the worst time to have a failure is at runtime as compared to when you're developing right. it by yourself. Because the most expensive code, uh, code to fix is code that's already in production. Yes. And trying to find those issues. So here, it's already telling us that we have some issues. And I don't even have any of the additional Roslyn capabilities. This is just core.NET compiler functionality that's built into place. Mm -hmm. um, and so we can go in and see we, we do have... Uh, some warnings, some messages, and if you're like me, a lot of the companies that you see or a lot of projects you're probably on have a lot of warnings that you're not paying attention to. Right. One of the things that you can do in the project settings is go in here and change the properties of the project settings under the build area. And if you really want to be uh, pedantic about it, there is a setting in here under the errors and warnings, which is treat warnings as errors. Right. So that's going to then say, OK, any warning that you had is now an error, and the compiler is going to fail until you fix that. OK, that's so one approach. If you want to do that, you can do that. <laughs> However, realize then, yeah. if you then check that code in, then you're going to break the build, and then it's on you to fix all, everything. Right. right. So you may not want to do it that way. But you want, probably want to get your uh, team to start paying attention more to some of these, because they may be able to provide some good uh, information. So for example, on these warnings, it tells me a couple of things. One is unreachable code detected. And you can probably see right in here, because it's uh, dimmed out a little bit, that here's code that actually wouldn't be able to be reachable. Okay. Um, and I don't know if you can see why that's unreachable. And we have an if block, and then if we do this and throw that, otherwise we're going to keep on doing that, right? Right. Well. If, that would be right if it was Python or F-sharp, where white space is important. But in C-sharp, the if statement, if it's not inside of a um, um, region, will, or a bracket, will then only do that for that one line. Right. right? And so they actually have added, uh, a while back, a analyzer that says, for every if block, we should have braces around what's the contents of the if block, because to solve for the people that are actually doing these kinds of things. So here, it actually not only says that there's a problem, mm -hmm. but also tells you how you can fix it. OK. Right? And this is all native Roslyn kinds of uh, capabilities. So now I can say, oh, yeah, that throw block should have been inside of there, and then this actually will, it was reachable it. code, right? OK. So it's already finding issues within my code that I may have missed when I was just writing it. Or it may have been the case where I wrote it originally, I made some changes, I mm -hmm. forgot to move this curly somewhere else, and just we, we slipped our mind to be able to get those pieces, right? Okay. Uh, so making the code all, uh, better already. The next one is the variable ex is declared but never used. Right. And this is particularly important because this is in a catch block, and this gives the performance implications. Where if we're trying to catch something, if we just do a catch and not have a variable that we're defining with that and nothing inside the catch block, then there's not a performance implication. But if we do have a variable, then there's a performance implication where we have to stop the processes, evaluate everything before we can actually move the code, move on. And so you know, ways that we can do that. I'm not going to fix this quite yet, because I'm going to do some couple other things here with okay. this as well. The first thing is I'm actually going to turn on the additional Roslyn analyzers. And so there are a couple of ways that you can do that. Originally, what you would do would be add a NuGet package to the project. Right. And you would add uh, FXCOP. FXCOP mm -hmm. actually came out originally back in 2005. It's been a long time. Yeah. Right? And many people, they installed it. They had 2,000 errors. They, they diligently it. went through those 2,000 errors if they were, you know, they were really good, and then saw, oh, now I, I'm, I'm good. I did all that work, and now I try it again, and now 2,000 more errors because they were capping the number of errors they were going to get from performance okay. perspectives inside of the tool. At that point, they installed it. Yes. Right. Right. Um, 
but with the future versions, they now rewrote the Roslyn analyzers or the um, the um, FX copy analyzers in Roslyn, so that you can then put it directly in. And now, as of .NET 5 and beyond, you don't even have to pull in a separate package as part of the framework itself. Okay. So with that, instead of adding a NuGet package, I'm actually going to go into the project file itself, and I'm going to say enable NET analyzers, yeah, okay. uh, and just set that to true. And notice when I save this, right now I have two warnings and 21 messages. Mm -hmm. When I save this, this is a fairly small project, but it should then start to think a little bit and find that, oh, I actually oh. have an error. Oh. Whoa, right? Holy cow. And now we're up to 31 messages. So it's adding more functionality and finding more things about that uh, and uh, being able to go forward with that. So the errors that it found is that I'm not disposing something that implements I disposable which could cause for memory leaks, okay. right? And so we might want to go in and fix those. By default, this setting is actually not a, an error. It's only just a warning. Right. But I've gone into in my project, and I've already customized this to say, I want to treat this particular rule as an error. So okay. you know, one of the things that you do, and the reason why we didn't use the FX cop originally was because it was, had too many rules turned on. And so now we can go in and customize those rule sets. And there's several ways that you can do that now. One of those is if you have an editor config, I can just double click on this editor config and see here's the analyzers, mm -hmm. and then find, for example, that CA2000. And here it is. And I can then set the severity that I say for my project, this is what, or my company, this is what I'm going to say is the severity for that particular okay. thing. You can do it at a solution level. You can do it at a project level. And the project levels can override the values at the solution level as, as well. Mm -hmm. So that way you can cascade that. Because there are certain ones where on the disposable, you don't want to dispose it. For example, HTTP context. Okay. Uh, you actually want to let the um, dependency injection manage the lifecycle of that. And so then if you check that into source control, then everybody gets it, and that's how you enforce it across multiple people working on a project? Exactly. Okay. Yeah, everybody, this is part of the source control. Everybody is going to have the same rule set, uh, and, and uh, life's going to be good at that point. Cool. And you can add more rules. You can mm -hmm. take some rules off and say, yeah, I don't think in our particular project we need to care about globalization rules because I'm just building a mom and pop website. Right. Right. So, um, or I, I am a multinational. I want to make sure that I'm be, going to be able to observe the globalization rules. And right. there are all sorts of rules. Uh, you can specify whether I want to allow for VAR or not. Mm -hmm. you know, that's, a, that's a controversial <laughs> subject. Yes. Uh, you know, and so all of these kinds of things are, are areas that you're able to customize inside of here. So I can go in and I can uh, select that one. It shows me where the problem is. And it can even give me a recommendation because it knows basically what I want to do, that I want to put that in a using block. And also, if you're using more recent versions of C Sharp, you can use the using statement rather than the using block. Right. So if you didn't know that the using statement was available, then this is one of the great ways of learning about new language features as right. well. Yeah. Right? So here I can just go ahead and use that var p, um, p equals new person and get Jim is also Jim is a person. Uh, hi, I'm Jim. Uh, and so I can then uh, configure that and uh, add that as a uh, just using var for that and life's good there. All right. Right. So that's good. Mm -hmm. We're finding new things. And it's going to be able to fix it for us before we you know, get to production and not have to worry about doing it later. Um, but I also said one of the great things about Roslyn is they allowed for other people to take advantage of all, all of the lexer and parser and things that the compiler team has done, have right. done and exposing that out, right? And so here I'm going to go ahead and manage some NuGet packages. I'm going to add a couple more NuGet packages. Remember here at this point we're at zero errors uh, two warnings okay. and 30 messages, right? All right. And so I'm just going to go out on NuGet packages, and I'm going to find a couple. And there's some numbers that are out there. So for example, there's one called Roslinator. And I can go ahead and add the Roslinator, Roslinator analyzers and apply that one. Uh, I first got started with this one um, by working on an open source project called Codecracker. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'll pull that one in. 
One of the great things is most of these libraries are all open source. So if you wanted to build your own analyzer, you could go out and look at some of the ones that are already there that do mm -hmm. similar kinds of things to what you want to do, and then build your own to be able to extend that and, and capabilities. And, and your own could be as simple or as complicated as, as you need. You yep. have four things you want to enforce. You build your own. You could build your own analyzer to report on those four things only, or you can make it large enough as these guys did to be more broadly available. Yeah. Uh, another one. Many of you may be using Sonar already, right? And so Sonar usually works in your DevOps pipelines. Okay. And so uh, Sonar has added one an analyzer so that you can do that at your development time rather than having to wait till you actually check it in oh, and okay. uh, do that on the other side. So we'll add in Sonar as well here. And there are other ones out there as well. Uh, if you're interested in building your own, I actually have a set of hands-on labs on how to build a couple of these oh, okay. as well cool. off of my um, GitHub repository. So if you GitHub uh, slash jwoolly, uh, then you'll be able to uh, right. find some of those uh, re repo repos there. All right, we may, uh, I think we should. We should do an episode or two on that. Yep, that would sound fun. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, so now, notice we now have two more errors, yeah. 52 warnings, Ooh. and 59 messages. So just by adding these additional analyzers, we're able to find more and more other things. So let's take a look at what now a couple it, of those are. Is it possible you've added three different three analyzers? Is it possible that they would ne not necessarily agree with each other on certain things? So you could get conflicting messages from one versus the other? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Right? And that's where you have to be able to go in and say, I want to turn this rule on or turn okay. that rule off. Uh, particularly, I mentioned FXCOP before. Mm -hmm. There's also StyleCOP. And right. StyleCop is even more picky around yes. where are the curlies and where are the spaces and are there spaces at the end of a line that you don't necessarily see. Right. You know, some of those kinds of things can be very specific around. And that may not agree with some of the rules that other, other people have had. So okay. what you want to do is you know, have your style guide and then customize the rules to agree with the style okay. guide rather than having your style guide just enforce whatever the rules are that the tools are using themselves. Okay. Right? got it. Because, yeah, there will be conflicts. But in this particular case, um, I don't think that there really are conflicts. Let's take a look at the errors, for example, here. First one is I have an invalid URI. Mm, okay. Well, this is a URI. URI just takes a string. So a string the compiler says is good. Yeah. It doesn't know that what's inside of that string isn't necessarily good. Mm -hmm. Now, we can do that with the string literal right here. If we created a variable and concatenated strings up above, it may not be able to catch all that just because of the complexity of trying right. to do all of those things. It's not going to go and search the web to see if that's a valid URL. Right. right. But, but it, it actually, what it, what it under the covers does is it says, I have newer URI. So I'm trying to create a new URI, mm -hmm. and it's going to then take that string and then try to do a new URI on that string. Mm -hmm. And if it fails, then that's what it's telling you is actually okay. happening under the covers. So it's actually executing a little bit of code to be able to find that that right. was the problem under the covers. Cool. Right. Um, so yeah, we, we can fix this one, and uh, we can do HTTPS link.com. Whoops. And and now we have an, an URI, it's valid, the mm -hmm. error goes away, and now we're catching this at developer time rather than at compile cool. time, right? Yep. Uh, let's take a look at this other one. Invalid referen argument reference in string format. And the string format says his parent is one, and we have one thing, so we're good there, right? Yeah. Well, how many times have we gotten bitten probably by this is zero based rather than one based, right. right? And so it should have been his parent here is zero rather than the one. And that's going to fix yeah, that one, right? And we can also see, well, we have some little suggestions, those little dots under the first line. That's mm -hmm. actually coming from the messages. So if I dot on that, I can say, well, we can change this string format into an interpolated string, mm -hmm. which makes it more simple, simplified okay. and also gives us IntelliSense right inside of the string, right? right? One of the great things about uh, string interpolation. So there are other things that we can do now uh, when we added that one. So for example, on this git gem, it's indicating there's numbers of issues potentially in here. So I can say, well, just control dot. Control dot is a wonderful thing in Visual mm. Studio. You know, otherwise you have to move your mouse and find this little light right. bulb and you yeah. know do all that. With control dots or period, then life opens up for everybody. If you're not familiar with that one, if you learned one tool to use today, then make sure to use that tool. Okay. Right? So we get control dot, and I might want to use far rather than person person equals new yep. person. That might be a little too repetitive. Make that a little bit easier. And then I might be able to use an 
object initializer here to simplify the initialization of those pieces. Yeah. Uh, and then maybe I want to inline that local variable because I don't need to declare it and then return it. Just go ahead and return the local thing. Um, and then maybe I want to use this as an expression body member. Yeah. Um, be more functional in my code, which looks a little cleaner. But you know, get Jim. This probably should be a property rather than a function, right? So let's change that over to a uh, replace it with a property. And oh, now with, with properties, we can also use expression many um, properties and members rather than functions, mm. right? So we're learning all the new ways that we can do this. And how we're many of our those, code. how many of what you just showed is because of the analyzes you added versus already built into the product and. I've Just done this demo there. so many times, I can't remember the name, answer to that one. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but actually, you know, one of the things that you can see is if you look at the warnings messages and things like that, you'll see the code that's down here. Mm -hmm. And each one of the various tools uses its own prefix. Okay. Right? And you can also click on any of these to then go to help information about why is that rule important, okay. what can you do to fix that rule, and, and, and those kinds of things mm -hmm. as well. So it gives you all those capabilities. There's a lot more that we could do with this. Uh, for example, come down here and see this can vote. It's then saying, well, uh, because Codecracker is telling me that I have trailing white space in there, and I'm missing pieces on my XML comments, two, di two different rules found. But it's also say, finding that um, both the IDE tools, the um, Roslinator tools, and the Codecracker tools all identified that min age isn't used. Okay. Right. So now we have a variable that we're not using. Right. Uh, we can probably get rid of that. So we can just uh, see if we can get rid of min age here. And we don't need that. That should remove the other issue with the code comments, right? And here it says, well, this is a lot of extra code we don't really need. Uh, the more code that you have to evaluate, mm -hmm. the, the more brain cycles you have to use. And if you can simplify the code, then your code is going to get getting better. If I were paid over the lifetime of my uh, coding experiences on the number of lines of code I wrote, I'd probably owe a lot of money because <laughs> I've probably removed more lines of code than I've written over time. Okay. Right? So here I can say if the age is greater, and it's three of them are telling me that I can actually simplify this instead of doing an if else and returning true or false. Just go ahead and return the output of that expression, right? right. And so we can go ahead and solve that. And oh yeah, if we want to make this more functional, uh, just pull that all down in one line, right? Um, so, how much of, of that is more a stylistic thing, um, you know, versus required? So, mm -hmm. the app runs, but you could have written the code better. You could always write the code better. Yeah. And this is great as a learning tool, um, but you got deadlines. Shipping is also a feature, right? You got new features you need to build. So how do you kind of juggle this kind of constant perfection versus mm -hmm. uh, getting the job done? How do you yeah, say, wrap your head around that? Yeah, some of it has to do with understanding what the rules are mm -hmm. and figuring out which of the rules do we really care about, right? right? And Microsoft has a list of here's the recommended rules. Here's the latest rules, or here's the extended rules. And then you can go in and change those as well. So you can take an existing application that you've bit, written and add some of these analyzers and then say, well, this rule we don't really care about. Mm -hmm. You know, it's more stylistic. This rule actually is important. So for example, if we take a look uh, at a couple of the other ones, like this one, this order by, order by, this actually isn't going to function the way that you think it's supposed to function. Because okay. the second order by is going to overwrite the first order, right? What you should actually have, and this is telling you specifically that you should have an order by and then a then by. Okay. To make sure that the okay. second you, you're reordering. So it's going to give you a different result in your application, which is important. Yes. So you may want to really care about that one. Right. Right? Um, and so you, you know, that's where you go in and you customize it. You say, which rules are going to be errors? Which rules are going to be warnings that we really care about? Right. Which rules are maybe messages? It might be a style kind of thing that we might want to improve over time uh, and have those aligned pro appropriately. I like the idea of, of potentially making that an error since it's not going to do what you think it's going to do, mm -hmm. which, which sounds like an error to me. Yeah, I would It's agree. a little bit more than a warning. This code's not going to do what you think it's going to do. should be an error. Yeah. And I can, you know, there's also kinds of things where it might be a performance issue. Mm -hmm. So here, for example, we're concatenating inside of a loop. 
Right. And that's going to have performance issues of garbage collection uh, kind of challenges. Mm -hmm. And so we may want to say, if we find things like this, then we may want to enforce that we actually right. use a string builder or you know, a better kind of methods for doing those kinds yeah. of things as well. So you're know, trying to figure exactly where these go. In my hands-on lab, for example, I have a analyzer with code fix that detects a, um, with an MVC controller where there's a, a um, convention that the controllers need to end in the word controller. And if it doesn't end in the word controller, then when it's doing the routes, it just won't find it. Mm -hmm. It compiles fine, but you'll never actually be able to have that resolve. Right. And so I have an analyzer and a demo of how you can build an analyzer there that can analyze and find it. And also it says, well, I know that it has to end in the word controller, so here's how you can fix it. And not only do an analyzer, but also an analyzer and a code fix. Okay, cool. So much of this is built into the product, ships mm -hmm. with Visual Studio. Um, and then, as you showed, there's a number of uh, third-party, community-based analyzers you can get and play around with. I assume these all work in Visual Studio code as well? Yes, they do. All right. So yeah. there are extensions you can add? Uh, yeah, it, it's the same analyzers that you, okay. you, you plug in there. Uh, depending on what version of uh, VS Code, you may need to add another extension to do that. Okay. Um, but yeah, the, uh, the analyzers will work in both. And the analyzers also can work within your build process. Mm -hmm. So making sure that you're enforcing these rules when it actually goes to build rather than just only doing it at development time. Okay, awesome. And then the more you play around with it, the, you can kind of find the sweet spot between uh, constantly perfecting the code and identifying things that aren't going to work. And there's, based on the project, based on the time you have, based on what you're doing, there's kind of a sweet spot that you can discover over time. Yeah. Excellent. This is very cool. OK. Thanks. For, we'll have some uh, notes. Uh, we'll have some links in the show notes where people can learn more. Um, mm -hmm. but. What is a good place for people to learn more about this stuff? Uh, with Roslyn uh, and, and building your own, there aren't as many good resources. I mean, okay. Microsoft Learn and, and the docs are, are probably the best resources to be able to get at. But the best way of learning, from my perspective, is to find some of those open sources, if you want to build your own, okay. to find some of the open source projects and just playing around with them and okay. trying to see what it is that they do to know how, do, how can we extend that to be able to do right. it ourselves. And then if you're just going to use them just go find ones that exist and mm -hmm. put them into some code and see what they come up and say. Yeah. And then decide for yourself uh, how much you want to rely on them. Yeah. Excellent. I, I, by default, probably pull in the net analyzers, which are part of, you know, just turn that flag right. on on your projects. Yep. Uh, and that's a good starting point, at least. All right. Great. Thanks so much You're for welcome. showing us this. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Highly recommend you start playing around with it even more uh, than you already are. And we will see you next time on Visual Studio Toolbox.